Hey guys, what's up and welcome to this Q&A. As always, thank you so much for your questions. And also, also as always, if I don't answer your question in this video, then go ahead and copy and paste that same question onto the bottom of this Patreon post and I might answer it in the next one. Also, don't forget to post any new questions that you have as well as like all the questions that you want answered because I generally answer the questions in order of how many likes they have. So let's jump right in. Ashirogi asks, hi Matt, I'm hoping you can clarify a couple of your recent tweets. So tweet number one. I've increasingly come to believe that the most important factor in language acquisition is motivation. Given the same input, the person who feels they need to learn the language will acquire it the fastest. This is the largest advantage that infants have, monumental motivation. Tweet number two. When you're watching something in your target language, don't try too hard to understand it. Most learning happens naturally, not through exerting effort. If you're always flexing your brain when listening slash reading the language, you'll start to feel like flexing your brain is necessary in order to understand. In order to be able to understand effortlessly, you need to practice effortlessly understanding. Is this directed towards someone who is already able to understand a lot in order to shift from a more strained understanding to a more effortless one? Or is it aimed at beginners who have to translate in their head in order to comprehend immersion? I remember you mentioning in the video how to not think in your target language that translating in your head is unavoidable in the beginning. Doesn't flexing your brain go hand in hand with translating in your head? Also, doesn't trying hard doesn't trying hard go hand in hand with somebody who's extremely motivated? So, good question here. Obviously, the problem with Twitter is that you have a very limited character limit. So, I know I I tweet these things out and I think, oh wow, this is a this is a pretty good insight. I'm I'm excited to share this with the world. And then it tends to garner a lot of confusion because the idea needs more than like 100 whatever characters in order to be fleshed out. So thank you for this opportunity to flesh out my idea a little more. So yeah, two main ideas here. The first tweet is mainly talking about motivation. And then the second tweet is talking about effort while immersing. So to first address this one about motivation. So the thing about this word motivation is that it has many different meanings. And I meant this, this sense of motivation in, in a very particular sense when I tweeted this out. So the, the sense of motivation that I meant was a sense of, on, on like a subconscious level, a necessity to have language ability in that language. So for example, if you are living in a country and everyone in the country is speaking a foreign language and you don't understand that foreign language, and because of this, you literally are not able to like buy groceries at the store or express any of your needs, then you are gonna be extremely motivated to acquire that language. And because this is actually gonna interfere with your survival, this motivation is something that exists on a, on a subconscious level, right? Like very a deep part of your mind is gonna realize, oh shit, this is really important. And similarly, but on a little bit of higher level, right? If you live in a country and, and you really identify with people who, who speak a, your target language, right? You view them as your in-group, right? You, you don't view it as, oh, I'm American and you know, they're Mexicans. And so, you know, I'm, I'm gonna speak their language. You have to, if you view it as like, they are Spanish speakers and I am also a Spanish speaker, a Spanish speaker, and we are the same, you know, they are my in-group, then you're gonna have a lot of subconscious motivation in order to sound just like they do. Like imagine you're, you know, you're, yourself as, as an elementary schooler in a classroom and you pronounce a word funny and then everyone laughs at you, right? Even as an adult, we still have that part of our minds that, that, are, that are hooked up with, with shame, right? We don't want to experience shame. Shame is, is one of the, the most awful psychological experiences that you can experience. Shame, embarrassment, right? And so if you identify with your target language culture and, you're, and the speakers of your target language, then if you sound funny to them, right? You're not able to sound like they do, you sound kind of funny and they might kind of smirk at you or just feel that you're different, then you will start to associate shame with that. And that's gonna create really deep, like sociological motivation, right? And, and like so much of our brain is motivated by our relationships with other people, right? And our, our we're, we're social creatures at our core, right? So if you really identify with speakers of your, of your target language, then now you've kind of hooked up your, your core animal brain, right? Your social animal brain to, your lang to language learning. And that's gonna create a huge amount of subconscious motivation. So this is the kind of motion, motivation I was talking about, this subconscious type of motivation where you just feel a deep need to know the language and know it at a high level. And this is very different than what we might call willpower type motivation, which is like, are you motivated to wake up early in the morning and do your Anki reps and watch things even if it's, even if they're not very exciting and you'd rather do it in, in English, right? This, this type of motivation we might call willpower. 
and it's very different type of motivation than what we might call you know a, a necessity a link for language ability you know feeling an, a, a need to have language proficiency now obviously the, there's in certain situations going to be some some like overlap between these two because if you feel this necessity to speak your target language then it's, it's more likely that you'll feel you know motivated to wake up in the morning and do your Anki reps but overall they can be very separate and so basically the idea with this tweet is that when when you're immersing like if you had two people let's say and they were both getting the same exact input in the language but one of them didn't have this kind of like subconscious sociological need for the language and another person did the person who had that, that deep so sociological motivation they would acquire faster because their subconscious mind would be more motivated so this is actually separate than the willpower thing because the willpower thing is a more conscious type thing right are you are you consciously motivated to like take certain actions Right? But you might be very consciously motivated to want to learn the language, but subconsciously your mind might not really care. Right? I, generally, I think there is a correlation. You know, I think if consciously you feel passionately enough about the language, then that will send the message to your subconscious that it's important. But they're not necessarily tied together. Right? Like for example, let's say we had somebody who you know had to do immersion because they were, someone else was forcing them to. Right? In this case. Maybe someone points a gun to their head and says, like, immerse for five hours a day or I'm going to kill you, right? This person would have a lot of, like, willpower type motivation to do immersion, but maybe they don't actually care about the language. So this person, their subconscious mind would not be very motivated, but they'd be very motivated consciously. Whereas, you know, we might, so, so in that, in that, this is obviously an extreme case. In this case, I think they would acquire the language very slowly because their subconscious mind isn't, like, convinced that the language is important. But, you know, even though consciously they, they are doing the immersion, right? But in most cases, we, the reason why we decide to take on immersion and go out of our way to immerse is because the language is important to us. So most any, anyone doing immersion has a certain degree of this subconscious motivation, like kind of by default, right? Assuming that you're not being forced to learn the language by some kind of outside force, then obviously you're motivated, you feel passionately about the language, and this is going to create this unconscious motivation to learn the language. But it's not all equal, right? I think people who, you know, really identify with their, the, the group, the, the target language group, for example, they are going to have w way faster gains than somebody who, you know, just likes watching TV shows and there's no real social ramifications of, of language ability, right? Because of course we're social creatures and our so much of our emotional system is hooked up with, you know, the, our social brain. And that's really where, you know, the motivation comes from. So that's really the first idea here that motivation is really important, this kind of subconscious motivation. Uh, when you look at different results that people have in the language learning community, I think this accounts for a lot of them, even more than potentially like how they did their immersion and stuff like that. So then on the other hand, we have this idea of flexing your brain versus not flexing your brain. So this is an idea that basically goes back to Stephen Krashen, right? It goes back to the input hypothesis, which says that true language ability is built when we are acquiring language, which is a subconscious activity that happens when we're not even conscious that we're so that we're learning a foreign language, right? Like I think the ideal state when the when the maximum amount of actual real acquisition happens is in those moments where you get so into what you're listening to or who you're talking to that you forget that it's even in a foreign language, right? You just have that moment when you're just into the story, into the conversation, you forget that it, 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 it ceases to become language learning and it just becomes life. In that moment, that's when your subconscious mind is fully taking over and doing all the acquisition. And so I think when you when you think about the, the overall language learning process, there there is a role for your conscious mind to play in, you know, memorizing vocabulary, understanding how grammar works, you know, doing intensive immersion and kind of analyzing the sentences. And basically by doing the, the role of doing this, right, is in order to make input comprehensible, right? Because for us as an adult language learners, it's hard to get huge amounts of, of very highly comprehensible input in our in our target language. So we kind of, instead of just trying to do, you know, a full comprehensible input approach, we instead learn the base, basic words, we learn the basic grammar, and we kind of use our conscious mind in order to make things comprehensible so that then we can acquire them. That's kind of how this, this the strategy of refold works. But the thing that's important to understand is that the true acquisition still happens in those moments when we're not thinking about the language. I think what happens is in those moments when you're actually consciously analyzing the language, the most of that input isn't isn't really reaching, getting deep down in, into that subconscious part of your brain. You know, I think it kind of when you if you if you think about the language input is almost like it's like a, on a conveyor belt, 
and first it that you know it, it first goes past your consciousness and then rolls to your unconscious if you like take the language input off the conveyor belt with your conscious mind and start analyzing it then you just took it off the conveyor belt so it doesn't end up going all the way down and reaching your your subconscious language acquisition device obviously this is a very simplified analogy but it's kind of how i think about it so in those moments when you're analyzing the language you're you're not getting a lot of acquisition you're probably getting some but not a huge amount and so what, that's why we have this distinction between intensive immersion and and free flow immersion right intensive immersion you're basically doing the the you're, you're putting all the things in place to increase comprehensibility so that later when you kind of turn your brain off you'll understand a lot more than you did before and that and when you're in that mode then that gives you the opportunity to kind of get into that flow state when maybe you, you, you forget about the language you just kind of get into the story and then you're going to acquire a lot more because you get into that ideal flow state when you're not you know, consciously analyzing the language, you're just kind of flowing with the story or with the conversation, and then you leave the analysis of the language up into your conscious mind. So if you're always analyzing the language, right, flexing your brain, translating it in your head, or even if you're not translating it in your head, thinking about, okay, this is verbs in this form, this is in this other form, then you're, you're depriving your subconscious mind of an opportunity to kind of do its own work on the language, right? Your subconscious mind, the part of your mind that acquires the language, it we it's a kind of a black box from our perspective right it we, it's some kind of you know machine learning style algorithm that figures out how language works on its own accord and we don't really know exactly what it does but we know that it generally does its job very well so you want to have some time where you're just like allowing that subconscious part of your brain to do work its own magic do whatever it does and acquire the language without you consciously kind of interfering with it and so you, you deprive your subconscious brain of that opportunity by always compulsively thinking about it. And a lot of times, you know, people have this kind of assumption that, okay, right now it takes effort to understand, but if I, you know, practice this enough, it will become effortless. And that might be true to a degree, but it's even more true to say that, well, actually, the it becomes effortless due to acquisition. And acquisition happens when you're not exerting effort right? When you forget about the language, that's when you're getting the most acquisition. So if you want it to become effortless, you have to actually stop putting in effort to provide your unconscious mind with an opportunity to acquire the language and, and have it do some true acquisition that's not actual, you know, conscious learning. So I think a lot of people, they don't do this. They kind of compulsively always think about the language. And so they end up kind of like always with this hybrid where basically it's like a catch-22 right they when when they stop thinking about it they don't understand therefore they never stop thinking about it but because they never stop thinking about it they never actually give themselves the opportunity to acquire it fully so that they can understand it without thinking right so the only way to get out of the cycle is to just stop thinking have your comprehension go down at first for a little bit but then it will go back up when you when you allow your subconscious mind to actually do the acquisition so to put it all in, into context, right? You, it is very helpful to be thinking about it and flexing your brain some of the time. That's what intensive immersion is for. But you also need to have a lot of the time where you're doing free flow, where you're not, when you're not consciously flexing your brain and allowing that process to happen naturally. So that is kind of the context of the two tweets. Now to actually put them together and answer your questions. So first of all, is, is, so talking about the flexing your brain tweet, is this directed towards somebody who's already able to understand a lot or, or is it directed towards beginners? I'd say this applies to, to everyone equally um, because again, you, you want to be acquiring the language the entire way, right? Like that, this whole thing is about language acquisition. Language acquisition happens most readily, most actively when you're not flexing your brain. So you want to be having lots of long periods when you're not flexing your brain right from the beginning, I would say. Now, you, you mentioned um, that I, it, it isn't translating in your head synonymous with flexing your brain. Yes, I would say so. Now, you do mention that I once said that translating in your head is unavoidable in the beginning. And I'd say, yeah, it is unavoidable because when you first start learning a foreign language and you're, you're, you're brand new, right, you're going to be compulsively translating things into your head. Just, it's just a process that happens to most of us that you can't stop. Right? So if I told you, stop translating in your head, that would be kind of like saying, don't think about a pink elephant. Right? It, wouldn't, it just wouldn't work. Right? If you've ever meditated, then you know that we don't have control over our thoughts. Our thoughts kind of do whatever they want to do. 
and we have some influence over them, but, but we can't just decide to not think about something, right? That just doesn't work. And so I think it, it's important to accept that some level of translating in your head is always going to happen so that you don't get frustrated trying to like suppress the translation process, even though that's not possible, right? So you got to accept, yeah, as a beginner, you're going to be translating in your head. It's going to be compulsive. You're not going to be able to stop that all the way. But you do have a choice in those moments when you find yourself translating in your head, whether you want to engage in that process and kind of feed that process, give it energy, or whether you want to let go of that process and kind of let it let it atrophy. So this is really kind of exactly what you do in meditation, right? Let's say you're, you're meditating and you're trying to focus on your breath. Well, if you're new to meditation, you're not going to be able to just force your mind to stay on your breath, right? It's going to constantly wander off to other thoughts. And that's just natural, right? So you accept that. But when you notice yourself having wandered off, then you bring your your mind back to the, the object of meditation. And then you wander off and you bring it back. You wander off, bring it back. And overall, the amount of time that you stay on the object gets longer and longer over time as you train your mind. And the, and the amount of uh, the speed with which you catch yourself wandering off also gets faster. So similarly, when you notice yourself translating in your head, we'll just accept it, that happens. And then just let the thought go and just don't, and then just let it go. Don't like feed it energy and go, okay, yeah, yeah, let's translate it. So this word means this, and then this grammar structure is like this. So in, in Japanese, this sentence means this in English. That would be a good translation. Like you don't want to be like engaging it and going down a rabbit hole. Whenever, as soon as you notice yourself translating, just let it go and not don't interact with it. And if you do that, over time, you'll translate in your head less and less and less. And even as a beginner, you can learn to not translate in your head from a, pretty, from a point early on. So I would recommend doing that because translating in your head is not very helpful. It's kind of a, a, a bad habit. But I would say, you know, don't try to suppress those thoughts because that's just going to lead to frustration and not work anyway. So yes, translating in your head is a form of flexing your brain. Yes, you uh, ideally you want to not do that. But understand that that's an ideal that you're probably not going to be able to, to reach right off the bat. And so there's there's that. And the last part of the question, doesn't trying hard go hand in hand with being extremely motivated? And I would say, no, it actually doesn't have to. Because if we were to imagine, for example, in an infant, right, a three-year-old infant who's watching a movie, and this, this three-year-old infant is like super into the movie, you know, he really wants to understand what's going on, you know, he has this, this deep intrinsic motivation, let's say, right, this kind of unconscious motivation to understand what's going on because he's like captivated over the movie. So he's very motivated, but he's not going to be thinking consciously about what the language is doing. So we know infants don't really do that. They don't have a, enough of a developed mind for that to even be possible. So they're not thinking, okay, so this this word was conjugated into this form, which means maybe maybe this certain type of inflection must have this certain nuance, or maybe this word is an exception and conjugates differently than other words. Infants don't think about that. You know, we can be pretty confident about that. But what the infant is going to be thinking about is the story, right? The infant's going to be thinking about, okay, he looks really angry and and she looks like, you know, kind of like embarrassed. So so she must have done something to make him upset. Was it when she threw that thing, that uh, those flowers on the floor? Is that what made him upset? So the infant is thinking about the meaning, right, of, of what, he's, what he or she is hearing, but not thinking about the form, not thinking about what the, you know, verbs and, and adjectives and conjugations mean. And so... This is what it would look like to not be flexing your, your brain in a language sense, but to be engaged in, in the meaning, right? You're still very motivated and you're still trying hard. So in a way, this is the ideal state. Now, even in this state, you know, you don't want to be flexing your brain too hard to the point where you're like short circuiting, right? But, you know, you're curious, you're engaged, you are kind of wondering about what messages you're receiving. And but because you're not consciously thinking about the form of the language, then you're giving your unconscious mind full reign to run its magic and acquire the language. And you're going to be understanding more of the messages due to your kind of curiosity. So I've definitely found when I, I've been doing some language experiments where I immerse in, in random languages, I don't know. And I definitely find that it's possible to get into this kind of flow state when you just kind of say, fuck it, I'm not even going to pay attention to the language, but I'm just wondering what's going on in the story. And, and you're just thinking, oh, okay, okay, so wait, he, so Okay, so that before, oh, that must have been another girl. Okay, so he's cheating on her, and oh, she she thinks she she might be aware of this, so she he, she wants to check his phone, or whatever. Like I, you can get into this mode where you're thinking about the story and you're guessing what they're what they're saying. If someone's yelling, and she's like, okay, he's probably saying, why are why are you cheating on me, or whatever. But you're not thinking about the the form of the language, and so that is the ideal state that you want to to be in in order to have the optimal acquisition happen. 
not thinking about the the con the you know oh this verb has this meaning and okay this has this definition blah 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 so i would say that yeah the, these things are kind of separate when you really kind of separate them out like this so hopefully that answered your question one other interesting tip that i'll add is that the the idea about motivation it can kind of explain why heritage speakers often lose the ability to speak their native language right like there's a lot of for example chinese born american people who you know their parents are chinese immigrants who moved to the the united states for example and so they grew up speaking chinese in the household right chinese was their first language the, the first language they learned how to understand and speak but then they go to school and they learn english and they start speaking english and then generally what happens is if you kind of look into this research then if the parents like pretend or if the parents truly don't understand english at all or maybe they do but they pretend that they don't understand english at all then the infant retains the ability to speak the heritage language, right? Because the infant has a need to, to be able to speak Chinese in order to communicate with their parents. But as soon as the infant realizes the parents understand English, then the infant loses the ability to speak English or to speak Chinese generally, because you know the infant brain is very efficient in a way, right? It doesn't just acquire language ability just for the heck of it, right? It, it, it only wants to do the, what is actually necessary. So if the infant brain learns, oh, I can get away with just speaking English all the time and I'll be totally fine, then it loses the Chinese ability. So again, this I think might have something to do with why some people in the community find that output comes really readily to them and some people find, find that it doesn't. Maybe it has to do with some of this unconscious motivation, right? If you've never spoken to a Japanese person before and all you've ever done is just watch anime in your room, well, then your brain might think that, okay, understanding Japanese is important, but speaking Japanese, why would I speak Japanese, right? Japanese is spoken by cartoon characters, not humans. And so maybe that's why, you know, output won't come. Whereas maybe in my case, right, I actually lived in Japan for a period of time early, early, early on. I had these experience of like really struggling to, to communicate because I didn't know Japanese. And, and that was like the bane of my existence. So maybe that's why output came so easily to me after a super long silent period because part of my brain knew, oh, Japanese is something I'm, that is spoken, something that's important for communication. I'm going to need this again. You know, maybe if I, I'll go back to Japan, I'll need it again. And maybe that's why it came more readily to me. So I, it's kind of a hypothesis. There are a lot of different factors at play here. But that's why I think the motivation component isn't really important. You have to think from your unconscious mind's point of view, does this, this language really matter? Does understanding matter and does speaking matter? And those might be two partially separate things. So good question there. Burned a lot of time right there. Maybe we'll try to go into a rapid fire mode now. So Jacob asks, hi, Matt, I'm learning Danish. Thanks to Refold and your content, I passed an equivalent of B2 level language exam, and now I'm able to passively listen to audiobooks in Danish. My humble estimate is that I understand around 70% of pop psychology slash self-help types of literature while I'm doing my house chores. I observed an interesting phenomenon when listening to audiobooks. I understand most of the story, I get the gist, or sometimes even whole sentences and paragraphs. The interesting bit is that if you'd asked me to explain the last couple of paragraphs that I've listened to, I wouldn't be able to do it to do so in any eloquent way in my target language. It feels like I remember the content slash meaning, but don't remember the words I listened to. Can you relate to such an experience and what could be the reason for it? So yeah, this is a totally normal experience. This is definitely going to happen to you. And it basically just has to do with the way that the brain processes information. So the way the brain processes information is that it, whenever you're listening to language, your brain is translating the language into mentalese. And the mentalese is actually what you remember. And this is true for your native language or any other language, right? So if you remember, like let's say watch a movie one time in your, in your native language, and then later try to recall some random conversation in the, in the movie, you'll probably find that you can remember the gist of the conversation but you can't remember the exact words. Maybe you remember a couple of words. Maybe if there was some really, you know, uh, impactful line where he's like, I said no, then maybe you remember the, the exact words for that particular line. But for most of it, you just remember the gist. You don't actually remember the words. And this is because this is, this is how the brain processes information. It translates the information into mentalese, and then it stores the mentalese and not the words. And I think the, the this is kind of just my hypothesis, the reason probably it does this is because it's much more efficient, right? In order to store word for word exactly what somebody said, that probably takes a lot of storage in your brain. Like when you think about how much effort it takes to like memorize a whole speech, right? You have to practice it a lot because 
you know, memorizing all these these particular words, like right. There's so many words that means this that mean the same thing. There's so many different ways to express a given idea. To remember the exact wording that probably is pretty taxing for your brain. So most of the time it doesn't do that. It just remembers the gist because that's a lot that's a lot cheaper. But I also think it's because you know the the way we understand the world in general is you know we 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 have this internal model of how the world works, and we make sense of things by basically translating and interpreting all of our experience into what may what the model that we already have right and so in order for you to even when you're to understand what somebody says you kind of have to automatically translate that message into your own mental ease right your own internal system of understanding the world and then this is what you you remember right so because i mean the act of understanding is inherently an act of translating into mental ease in the first place and so yeah, th this is this is normal. It's going to happen in, in in any language. It just has to do with the way that your brain processes language. And so then it, it goes back to the fact of, okay, when you're listening to your target language, of course, you're not going to remember it word by word. So then why can't you, and then given that that's the case, why can't you eloquently summarize what you heard? Well, probably because you don't have high level of output ability, right? Being able to eloquently summarize something in your in your target language takes a high level of output ability. And the whole read full roadmap is about getting you uh, eventually getting you to that point. But, you know, just because you can understand something, it doesn't mean that you're going to that like when well, you just think about it in general, right? Just because you can read Hemingway, that doesn't mean that you that you can write as eloquently as Hemingway, right? Of course not. Everyone's comprehension is way higher than their production ability, even in their native language. Right. And so but particularly when you're new to a language, you're not fluent yet, then th that gap between your comprehension and your production is going to be even larger. So, of course, you don't remember all of the words word for word because that's just not how the brain processes and remembers information. And then, of course, you can't summarize it just as eloquently because you don't have that the same level as uh, the same level of output ability as the original podcaster, right? Or the original person who wrote that book. So I'd say, yeah, it's totally normal. Basically, it's just a, a matter of, yeah, the better your output ability gets, the better you'll be able to get uh, at summarizing things. And if you want to try to memorize things verbatim, in general, the more your base level of language ability is, then the easier it will be to memorize things verbatim. But I mean, like I said, even in, in your native language, it's not that easy to memorize entire passages verbatim. You know, it takes a lot of effort. So that's just kind of how the brain works, I think. So Diller asks, according to the FSI language rankings, a native English speaker can learn French almost four times faster than Arabic, both having an, an easy to read alphabet. My question is, does this transfer over to refold? It seems that a baby would take the same amount of time to learn its native language, whether that's French or Arabic. And since refold tries to emulate how babies learn language, doesn't this mean that it would take the same amount of time to learn French as it would Arabic, as it would Arabic using the refold method? So interesting question, but no, the, that's not how it would work, because uh, basically, when you, you, as an adult, even if you're doing refold, your brain isn't starting from scratch when you're learning a foreign language. In fact, your brain, it's quite the opposite. Your brain kind of starts with your native language as a base. And then it, over time, as you get more input, it kind of shifts that in, into something that matches your target language. So imagine like you have English, right, in your brain. Then you're gonna start learning Arabic. What your brain basically does is make a copy of English and then slowly transform that copy into Arabic more and more over time. And so, if, if you imagine that, you know, you how what is the distance between transforming a copy of English into French versus translating a copy of English into Arabic? Well, obviously, it's way more steps, way more work to translate the copy of English into Arabic because more is different, right? With English and French, it's like a whole bunch of the words are almost the same. Uh, the grammar, the order, basic word order is largely the same. The, the way that pronunciation works is on some level similar compared to other languages like Chinese or Japanese that have like tones and pitch accent. And so even I think on an unconscious level, your brain is going to learn how to draw these connections, right? It's not like when you start learning a new language, your brain just immediately forgets everything that it knew about English. If that's how it worked, then in a way, getting to native level would be easier than it, than it truly is. Because a lot of the, the reason why it's hard to get to a native level is because you have to overcome biases that have been formed by your native language. Right? That's kind of the whole analogy of refold, right? That you unfold, you have an origami crane, you unfold it, and you have to refold it into something new, but you have all these old creases that can kind of hold you back and you have to overcome that. And so 
I, I would say even if you're taking a even if, if it you know put ref, you know refold to the side for a second let's say you even took a hundred percent immersion method when you're doing zero study and all comprehensible input you would still acquire languages that are closer to your native language much more quickly than more distant languages because your brain naturally is going to you know draw the, all the all the connections that are, that are similar and in fact I think if you I, I read something recently about the data from uh, from the automatic language growth. This was a school in Thailand that actually taught languages entirely through input. And they found that the, the even though they did zero study, it was all through comprehensible input. The amount of time it took for someone to reach fluency depended a lot on what their native language was and what the distance between the language was. Like Thai speaker, like Chinese speakers would get to fluency in Thai more quickly than English speakers got to fluency in Thai. So that's kind of like some evidence that this is how it works. So maybe the difference isn't as great. You know, maybe maybe instead of Arabic taking four times longer, it only takes three times longer or something like that. Uh, may, maybe there's something like that because when the refold method, you know, you're it's not quite as stark. But I still think, you know, due to all the things I just said, closer languages are definitely going to be way quicker than more distant languages when it comes to acquisition. So Daniel Panis asks, I believe you said in your interview with Stephen Kaufman that if an English speaker spends one hour every day getting input from Japanese, it will be 10 years before they can comfortably watch a Japanese movie with no subtitles and understand everything. Can you go into more detail into how you got that figure? Specifically, is that only if you're doing a listening input alone? Does that include if you're also taking the time to do Anki and sentence mining? Would doing a lot of reading input along with your listening speed up that process? So yeah, I mean, this is basically, this isn't like a figure that I like sat down and thought about really carefully and then was like, okay, here's the result of my calculations. It was more like I just said that off the cuff because Steve Kaufman was basically like encouraged, he was basically poo-pooing the idea of working, of like dedicating yourself to acquiring your your native language. And he was trying to say like, oh, well, you know, my, I do just fine. And I only spend, you know, two hours a day, one hour a day. And I was just trying to make the point where it's like, that's just going to get you nowhere in Japanese. And in fact, when Steve Co Steve Kaufman's Japanese is good because Steve Kaufman lived in Japan for nine years, probably doing Japanese close to full time. So that was kind of the, the background here. It wasn't like an exact figure, but to, I guess, expand upon it a little bit. Um, first of all, if you're limiting yourself to one hour of language learning per day, no matter what you do, it will take you at least 10 hours a day, or sorry, at least 10 years to get to the point where you're like truly fluent in Japanese. Honestly, you may never get there, uh, to just be frank. Uh, now, if you're talking about, okay, one hour of immersion and then an additional one hour of like Anki and other study, then maybe it would be a little, uh, then maybe, you know, you could shave off a couple years from that, you know, maybe you could get there. I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't know. It's really hard to say because the the all the people that I know who who are fluent in Japanese, they all had a period of time when they were spending like five plus hours a day on Japanese. I've literally never heard of anybody doing Japanese for one hour a day and then, OK, 10, 15 years later, I did it. I'm fluent. I've just never heard of it happening. So first of all, I don't even know if it is possible. Like it could just be that there's like a certain minimum amount of input you need per day in order to really break through and reach fluency in a level that's as different as Japanese. Um, or maybe not, maybe it is possible, but again, it's very hard to estimate uh, because there's no evidence to go off of at all, right? So I'm just kind of making an educated guess as to how my language learning process and the learning process of other people in the community who, who reached fluency would scale if you spread it thinly over the course of you know 10 plus years. So I'm pretty confident that with one hour a day, you'd never get there, maybe two hours a day, and now you're talking about immersion and doing Anki, that sounds a little more realistic, but it would still take a take a very, very, very long time, I think. And yeah, if you're doing reading, then that won't lead to you improving faster uh, than doing just listening. But even if you had like the optimal ratio of reading to listening to Anki, one hour a day is just never going to be enough, no matter what. I can guarantee it. Um, 10 years minimum, but probably longer. So Fukai Mori asks, what is the most common shortcoming you see language learners who are following the refold approach? What is the most common shortcoming you see in language learners who are following the refold approach? Sorry. Uh, why do you think these learners experience this issue? And what is your suggested remedy? I mean, I think honestly, the very first 
question in this Q&A addresses this pretty well. I think probably the downfall is that people don't take free flow immersion seriously enough and they they spend all their time doing intensive immersion. And so they get stuck in this trap where they don't give their brains enough opportunity to do that deep unconscious acquisition work. And so they end up having a lot of their comprehension be reliant upon conscious mechanisms that take effort to use. And so I, I would say more free flow immersion. Also, of course, too much relying on subtitles, too much reading, not enough listening. I'd say those two are probably the main two things that I that I see. Uh, Christian asks, you've mentioned that in your intense age at period, you would immerse upwards of six to eight hours per day. Did you ever get the feeling that you still weren't doing enough? I love the success stories from your interviews, most of which dedicated their whole lives to their target language for some period of time. And while I wish I could do that, it isn't realistic for me. I sometimes get the irrational thought, wow, you're, you're really doing this basic life function, for example, speaking with parents, instead of listening to your target language and recognize that those types of thoughts are unhealthy, especially when realistically I'm doing plenty of immersion. Any experiences with this? Do you think a, a moderation of this motivation is necessary for someone to become fluent as soon as possible? Yeah, I mean, I think a certain degree of this is just par for the course for anybody who's you know really working hard on their target language. I know I definitely had this. I mean, what I remember most saliently is that I, I developed like an aversion for silence. Like, cause whenever something, there was silence, that's time that I could have been, I could be listening to my target language. So I would start to get like this, like low grade anxiety when it was just silent. Cause I'm like, oh fuck, the clock's ticking. I'm wasting opportunities to get good at the language. And so I, I like wanted to fill that silence with like listening to the language. And I remember even after I quit doing like intensive age at, it took like, probably close to a year, maybe not that long, maybe a couple months to have this kind of, you know, slowly wear itself out and get to the point where I could be in silence and didn't have any intrusive thoughts about I should be doing more immersion. So I think a degree of this is realistic or sorry, a degree of this is kind of par for the course. And I, I don't think that like, I mean, I think it's the type of thing where whenever you're looking at somebody who's like truly first class in anything, like if you look at like ice skaters, right? It's really common for ice skaters, apparently I've heard, to develop eating disorders because it's so important for them to remain extremely thin in order for their performance, right? And, and to do well. And so this ends up getting a little bit neurotic about eating and you can develop, you know, be tend to develop eating disorders. Also, even uh, among uh, like bodybuilders too, who have to cut, I've heard it's really common to develop eating disorders. And so I think in general, whenever you're kind of pushing yourself to the limit and trying to extract the highest level of performance from yourself that you possibly can, that is going to lead to a little bit of neuroticism. I think that's probably a little bit of inevitable. I think it, it kind of is a little bit necessary, I guess, right? Because the reason why you're feeling neurotic about it is because you care about it so much and you ca and it's because you care about it that you're able to push yourself to the limit and, and, and achieve that level of performance. So I would, I would just, uh, I mean, I would treat it similar to how I talked about if, if you listen to the first question in this Q&A, uh, I would treat it the same way I talked about treating the intrusive thoughts about translation, right? Just accept that these thoughts are going to be there, but don't fuel them, right? Just let them be there, let them go, don't interact with them. And as long as, as you just let them be there and you don't interact with them, then they'll become less and less over time. Don't try actively try to suppress them. That can actually have the opposite effect, right? And make them even stronger. But if you just let them be there and don't interact with them, then they should be get quieter and quieter over time. So yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, if, if you need to, then like write it on a piece of paper, like what your goal is. Say, my goal is to immerse X many hours a day. And then if you're hitting that target, then give yourself permission to say, I don't have to do any extra. I'm I hit my goal. So I, I, it's okay for me to not do extra immersion. And that's kind of how I would think about it. Now you still will have those thoughts of, yeah, but I could do even more and I could do even faster, but I would just accept those and try to not, not fuel them basically. And, and that's just how, that's how I would, how I would go about it. So Cameron Worley asks, oh, and one other thing that I'll say though, uh, sorry, before I go on to the next question is that. I think we have this idea in our culture that I, Katsumoto had a really good article about this. He's like, everything in moderation, including moderation. So we have this idea in our culture that like, you need to be balanced. You know, you have to do a balanced life. You have to spend time with friends. You have to, 
uh, you know, spend time relaxing, watching movies. Like it, it's you can't just go hardcore on one thing. But I think honestly, this is kind of an arbitrary and somewhat unhelpful belief in our culture, because if you look around the world, there there's I think you can find lots of examples of times where for a certain limited period of time, people would be extremely dedicated to one pursuit. Like you, at least if you look at like meditation, for example, it's very, it, it's completely traditional to basically do meditation retreats where sometimes for up to, like if you look at the Tibetan tradition of meditation, they would have retreats. I think the longest ones are 10 years long where for 10 years, they would commit to basically just doing nothing but, but meditation practice all day, every day with no, no, no activities just for fun, no talking to the, to your parents, no talking to hanging out with friends for 10 years, they're just doing meditation. And of course, this is for a very minority of people within the society who are completely dedicated to this. And they were going to, you know, they're going to become like the sages of society. So they have to go through this hardcore training, but there's a place for that, right? Even when you look over the course of an entire lifetime, 10 years is still a minority. And so you can, and I mean, that's an extreme example, right? It's more common to have like three year retreats or even one year retreats or even just three month long retreats in, in the case of meditation traditions. And that's because it's just effective to dedicate yourself to something with the exclusion of all else for a period of time, right? So, and, and I think as long as, you know, you have guidance to make sure that like in the case of meditation, right? You have a meditation teacher who's kind of like experienced and they guide you through, they make sure you're, you're, you know, not going in a bad direction that, you know, you're not losing your mind and it's for a limited period of time. And you know that after that limited period of time, you're going to go back to having a balanced life. Then I think it's completely, it's, it's probably a good thing. It's very powerful, potentially, you know, um, overall, it's something that will be great for developing you as a person to have a period of time where you just dedicate yourself to one thing. So I'm totally glad that I spent, you know, close to five years just doing Japanese full time, because after that, I went, I went back to having a balanced life. I have a balanced life right now, but I have the results of my hardcore five year period, both in terms of language learning and the character development that I think it developed within me. So that was just a little rant to say that I, I think the this like cult of balance that we have in our culture of like, you need to do everything balanced, you know, is probably, I think, a little misguided, at least for periods of set periods of time, you know. So Diogo asks, uh, hey, Matt, I'm around stage 2B slash 2C, and I've noticed that my listening abilities have fallen a bit behind my reading abilities. To remedy this, I've been watching more shows without subtitles, but I'm wondering if there isn't something more I could be doing. One idea I've come up with is something like intensive listening, where I have the subtitles on, but with their visibility turned off. This would allow MPV to pause after every line, and then I would make the subtitles visible and check to see if there are any words that I knew but couldn't hear. Do you think this is a good idea? Should I temporarily switch from intensive reading to intensive listening? Do you have any other advice? So uh, he's asking two questions. So I'll answer the first question first. So I would not recommend this personally uh, because I think listening ability, I, I think what, what's going on here is um, if you haven't listened to the first answer that I gave in this Q&A, listen to that first. I'll assume you've already heard that. So basically there's, I would say two different modes that you can be in when you're getting immersion. One is what we might call a learning acquisition, a hybrid mode. This is where you're using your subconscious pool of acquired ability combined with conscious knowledge about the language in order to, and you can, you combine those together to, to understand as much as possible. And so, and, and that's one mode. The other mode is a full acquisition mode where you're not consciously thinking about anything and all of your understanding is due to your, un, your unconscious mind and what you've acquired. So the problem here is that when you're reading and you have the text in front of you and you can go at your own pace, then that allows for that hybrid mode to function really well, right? You, you actually have a lot of time and a lot of room to boost your understanding with your conscious mind, right? You can remember what words mean. You can interpret, con you can consciously analyze the, the grammar structure. And, and a lot of times, even the act of consciously using your, you know, using what you've learned to understand more, that itself over time for doing lots of practice, that itself becomes so automatic, you might start to feel like it's what you've acquired, right? But, but the problem is when you're doing listening, then because there's a built-in time limit, everything's so fast, 
and that and, and it's blurry you can't really hear what's going on then you're kind of you you can't use your, what you've learned nearly as much so you're kind of forced into this all acquisition mode and then you'll suddenly feel like oh your comprehension is way worse because you're you you know you can't benefit from all, all everything that you've learned right you, you're stuck with exact only what you've acquired and so the problem here is that you you haven't acquired enough so the solution to that is acquiring more and like i talked about the best way to acquire more is to be in this flow state where you're not consciously thinking about the language and you're letting your unconscious mind do all of the acquisition and so doing this type of intensive listening is actually the opposite of that you're trying to basically train yourself to use to basically use your conscious mind to use what you've learned to to boost how much you've under how much you can understand but i think that's kind of a dead end because the, the conscious mind is just never going to be fast enough to keep up with with the speed of natural language you're better taking the opposite approach and just spending tons of time watching with no subtitles like maybe actually have a period when you say okay for the next two months i'm going to do only free flow immersion with all listening i'm not going to read or use any subtitles and just kind of throw yourself into the deep end of the pool and if you do that then your listening ability at the beginning it'll be really rough and really slow but after a couple of weeks you'll you'll suddenly start having getting way more comfortable with listening so honestly that, that that i think would be a much better approach do less conscious interference not more with the when in the acquisition process that's question one question two is i just read the guide for the casual unstructured monolingual transitions do you have a more in-depth guide on how to do the monolingual transition I know I've heard you describe the process in more detail, but I'm not sure where. If there isn't a specific guide on this, do you mind sharing a couple tips and pointers on the structured transition? I'm learning Japanese. So I think I, uh, first of all, I have a video on my channel where I talk about the language, the uh, how I personally made the monolingual transition. If you type in Matt vs. Japan monolingual transition, I'm sure it will come up on YouTube. Also, I think back when we used to do MIA, uh, I wrote on the MIA guide a very detailed monolingual transition guide that maybe was ha had different instruction than my initial video. So if you go to the Wayback Machine and you search up match massimmersionapproach.com on the Wayback Machine and you find, it might have been the, the stage two guide. Can't really remember now. It's been a long time. But somewhere on that website, there's not that much content on the website total, so you should be able to find it pretty easily. Uh, I wrote a, a guide. That might be, maybe that's what you're remembering. So... Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to go about the monolingual transition. So yeah, I would read those two and then use that to, to as your guidance. And then yeah, the final question here, after completing the final step of the transition, should we switch our computer's language to our target language and start browsing the internet in our target language? So, I mean, I think about this question pretty more practically, like switch your, lang your computer to your target language when doing so is not going to completely fuck you over and make it so that you have no idea what's going on, right? Like, I don't really think it's that helpful to switch your computer to your target language right in the beginning because you're not going to understand anything. And now you're just going to end up spending lots of time being confused about how to change settings on your computer and stuff like that because you can't understand anything. And ultimately, the amount of input that you get from having your computer in Japanese is very minor. So switch your computer to Japanese as soon as doing so is not going to be a huge pain. And then it is helpful, you know, like a lot of times you'll notice like, oh, it's so annoying to have to read all the katakana, right? Oh, everything takes longer because I have to like read it in Japanese. Whereas in English, I could just skim, I could just skim it and get it. But that little extra work that you put in will actually help your Japanese ability. So I would, yeah, that, I would be more pragmatic about it. Like start doing it when, switch your computer or your phone when doing so isn't going to be a huge pain. When it comes to browsing your your browsing the internet in your target language, I mean that you can do early on as just a form of immersion, but I wouldn't like limit yourself to only using your target language until doing so is going to be like not too much of a pain. Like most people, they make the monolingual transition relatively early on, and so if you at the point when you first made the monolingual transition, if you try to just suddenly turn your computer in Japanese or read a Wikipedia article in Japanese there's going to be so many words you don't know that it's going to be completely overwhelming. So to feel like the only way that you can look something up is to like spend an hour decoding one paragraph on Wikipedia, like that's just kind of not practical in my opinion. So Jonas Ander asks, Hi Matt, I've noticed a problem I have with passive immersion. I learned English as a second language and both in my native language and English, I have no trouble listening to something while, while not really paying attention. 
Now I've been studying Spanish for almost a year and I understand between 95 and 99% of the content I immerse in. I recently stopped doing passive immersion though because I'm not giving it my full attention. Because if I'm not giving it my full attention, it's literally noise to my brain. It's pretty frustrating because I'm constantly listening to English podcasts, audiobooks, YouTube videos, and while, and while I'm working or doing something else, and I could use this time for Spanish immersion instead, but it just doesn't seem to work. So basically you just, you kind of have it backwards, you're right. You're, you're saying, I don't understand, therefore I'm not gonna listen. But it should be the other way around, right? It should be, I, I don't understand, therefore I will listen. And through listening, I will become able to understand. So this really directly connects with the first question that I answered today. So you might want to listen to that if you haven't if you if you haven't already. But basically, if when when you're paying attention, then you're you're able. Well, I actually I, you, I could I'm going to put it even more simply. Basically, in order to like understanding things passively without paying attention, you could think of that as its own skill that you have to you have to train by actually doing that. Right in English, you've spent tons of time listening to things passively and understanding them. And so if you want to get good at doing that in Spanish, you need to practice. So you said when, when you're not paying attention, it just becomes noise, but that's where you got to start, right? You got to try making, like actually practicing, like let's say when you're eating, working out, you know, commuting, still be listening to Spanish in the background and then just try to pay as much attention as you can. If you find yourself kind of waking up out of a, a thought and being like, oh crap, I just totally blanked out and didn't follow what was said for the last five minutes well then just start right start then right it's, it's kind of like the meditation right keep keep on restarting every time you catch yourself with your mind wandering off and then you'll get better and better at it so i mean i think to a certain extent it, it mostly is just an issue of the fact of you know that there's a certain degree to maybe which passively listening to things is a skill like i said a second ago but thinking about it further, I mean, overall, it's probably more just an issue of the better your base level of, of listening ability is, then the easy, then the more you're going to understand when you listen passively, right? And so right now, you know, you've only been studying Spanish for, for less than a year, right? So you're still really new to Spanish. So you're, you're right at the point where your comprehension is pretty good when you're paying attention, but when you're not paying attention, your comprehension drops. So even if all you did was actively immerse in Spanish and you got your listening to like even higher and higher and higher to the point where you understood like everything totally effortlessly, then eventually probably doing passive immersion in Spanish would, or, or understanding things passively would probably come pretty naturally, just automatically due to just raising your base level of ability. But you're wasting opportunities to do Spanish immersion, like you said, by waiting for that to happen. So you can definitely get lots of benefits of doing passive, um, listening to passive immersion by just trying to understand as much as you can. Maybe your comprehension is way lower than active, but what, who, what, who cares? What's the problem, right? If your comprehension drops from 95% to 70%, well, start at 70% and then go to 71 and then go to 72 and go to 73. So I would say, yeah, just keep doing the passive immersion. You'll understand more and more as you go. And the fact that you don't already understand it doesn't, isn't a reason to not do it, right? It's like, if you already understood it, then what would be the point in the first place? You could almost say, right? So Nick asks, if you took an all listening, listening approach to learning language in order to develop a perfect accent before reading, would it be harmful to use text-to-speech software where, not, where nothing else is available? For example, getting text-to-speech software to read out monolingual definitions where no other explanation is available, or putting text-to-speech on Anki cards such as Microsoft Azure, which is quite accurate. Uh, I would say yes, text -to -spe using text-to-speech would be harmful, but probably not, not to a, a large extent. I mean, obviously it depends on the quality of your text-to-speech. I know in Japanese, text-to-speech engines make a lot of pitch accent mistakes, and so I would personally avoid using text to speech. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, if you if you if you're just, you know, you look up something using text to speech. Like I've had the the thought of like you could use Siri, right? Just say like, hey Siri, what does X mean in Japanese, right? I would say that in Japanese, and then Siri could like define it in Japanese. And let's say you use that in order to to like look up words while taking an all listening approach. If you only heard that definition one time, I think it's totally fine. But it's going to be a lot worse if you put it on your Anki cards because the whole point of the Anki algorithm is that it basically burns things into your brain. And I've definitely found that when I have audio on my Anki cards, the, that audio gets burned into my brain like really deeply. So I definitely would never put a text-to-speech audio on an Anki card because that risks burning into your brain either unnatural prosody patterns, unnatural you know vowels and consonants, or pitch accent mistakes. So I would say overall, definitely don't put it on Anki cards. Maybe you can use it 
just to like look things up one off here or there. And as long as like 99.9% .9 of your input is from humans, then although it might be like harmful a little bit, it, it'd probably be negligible. So Anton asks, when outputting, I have a hard time with Japanese counters. I have trouble with both remembering which counter to use and how the pronunciation of a given counter, counter changes depending on the number of things being counted. Do you have any suggestions? I feel like this lack of acquisition doesn't really hinder my ability to understand the counters during input. Uh, the biggest thing is just you need more in, you need more input, more immersion. Uh, I found that this is something that came very naturally to me, but it's one of the things that comes later on. You know, so you know we acquire things in a certain order, and things that are less important generally take longer. You know, they they get acquired once everything else is already in place. So yeah, they, the, the counters might be something that co that comes later on along the line, but it's still something that I think you'll just acquire naturally by getting tons of input. So I would say don't overthink it. Just get Listen to Japanese for another one or two thousand hours, and that will probably fix your problem. But of course, it can help to you know pay a little extra attention to counters when you're listening. You know that that can help. So Reed asks, "Hi Matt, I'm perhaps fifty-five or fi or fifty-five to sixty-five percent through the JP1K deck. In my daily active immersion, when reading subtitles, I find myself often struggling to separate words as I'm reading. With the hiragana, katakana, and kanji so close to one another, I can't always tell where the where the words end." Is there anything I can do to improve this, or will this naturally improve as my lexicon grows? Uh, it will definitely uh, improve as your lexicon gr lexicon grows. It will improve as you do more reading practice. Also, uh, listening more will help a lot because when you when you listen, then you'll have a sense of what it's supposed to sound like, and when and when you when you can hear it, then it, it's it's a lot easier to identify the word boundaries. So, overall, yeah, listening will, will really help you intuitively know when one word starts and another starts. Oh, one word stops and another starts. Um, hey, Matt, my comprehension in French has improved a lot over the last year. However, I still have a lot of trouble being able to hear names, especially unfamiliar ones. Why is this and what can I do about it? I mean, I think part of the reason is because, you know, in, in real life, people speak in a very blurry way. But the reason we can understand them is because we, we already, you know, we have a model of how the language works. And so, you know, we it's not only a bottom-up process of piecing together what words they said by listening to the vowels and consonants. There's also a top-down process of predicting what people are likely to say and kind of matching that up with the sounds. So, for example, if I said like, like, oh, nice to meet you. My name is Matt. You know, if you had never heard the word Matt before ever in your life, even if you were a native English speaker, you might be like, huh? Your name's what? But because the name Matt is a common name that almost everyone has heard a million times, when I say, oh, my name is Matt, then you 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 I, you can match it up with the entry you already have in your brain of like oh his name's Matt that's a common name got it and because of that then it's no problem but in a foreign language you might you know not have the same level of of, of like kind of like a, a name database in your brain that natives have right because a lot of the there might it might be a, a name that you've never heard before but to natives they've all heard it a million times or maybe you have heard it before but you just don't have that same level of familiarity. And so when they say it fast, you can't catch it the same way, right? The thing about names is that they don't come up as much as normal words, right? Like the word for, for example, shirt is going to come up every single time someone's talking about a shirt. But, you know, the name Matt is only going to come up when there's someone named Matt in the conversation. So I think familiar with names is just one of the, it's just like I just mentioned with the counters. It's another one of those things that comes much later on in the language learning process, just because for any one given name, you don't get a lot of exposure to it just because every single person has a different name, right? So names work. So again, kind of the same answer as with the Japanese counters, I would say just overall keep getting immersion and it will get better and better over time. Uh, also, what you can do is memorize the names of French celebrities. This is what I do in Japanese and that's helped a lot because it, first of all, it just gives you an opportunity to build familiarity with a large set of common names and also the act of just memorizing the names will in general make you more conscious of names and help you just be more attuned to them in your immersion so that'd be my tip um anton asks uh, assuming someone took the all listening approach to learn japanese and assess and successfully achieved a native accent if they wanted to learn how to read how do you recommend they do so easy just watch japanese content with japanese subtitles that's it Actually, I think this is what Ken Cannon actually did. I think he said that like, Ken Cannon basically learned how to read entirely through listening. Check out the interview on my channel. 
And then the main way he learned how to read, I think, was actually playing Japanese video games that had like full full voice acting for all of the lines. So he could hear the hear the sentence, understood it, and then he would look at how it's written. And honestly, just by doing that, if you're truly fluent in the spoken language, just by watching Japanese content, like watching anime and movies with Japanese subtitles, you will learn how to read Japanese. Zero kanji study necessary. So last question for today, Hayden asks, well, this was a very interesting question. Uh, I believe I'm at stage four of the refold roadmap in Japanese and consider myself having basic fluency. The problem is I am at a, I am reading dominant and when I watch Netflix or shows in Japanese without subtitles, my comprehension drops drastically. And with subtitles, I can reasonably say that I understand around 85 to 99% comprehension, or that I can reasonably say that I have between 85% and 90, 99% comprehension, depending on the difficulty of the material. My question is, should I just leave subtitles on and never focus on improving my listening ability? Or should I turn subtitles off in hopes that my listening ability would get better? I guess basically what I'm trying to ask is what am I missing out on by what am I missing out on from turning off subtitles when I watch stuff in Japanese? I mean like in a long I mean like a long-term sense, what would be the cons of leaving subtitles on forever versus turning subtitles off in the case of a reading dominant learner? Do you personally turn subtitles on? Uh, I also just want to point out that I barely speak Japanese in real life anymore and don't plan on going to Japan. I only use Japanese to consume Japanese materials like video games, YouTube videos, and shows. So that's why I'm thinking of just leaving subtitles on so I don't really need the listening ability, I guess. Yeah, so interesting question. Basically, you're at the point where you understand with subtitles, you don't understand without subtitles, but you don't care about speaking Japanese. You only use Japanese for consuming content. So why does this matter? And so basically, what are you missing out on by needing subtitles to understand? Well, I'd say a couple things. First of all, lots of really good Japanese content doesn't have Japanese subtitles, right? And, and it's never going to, right? There's a lot of content that I come across that's just, hey, you want to watch this show? Subtitles don't exist for it. So if you need subtitles, too bad, you can't watch it. That's probably the biggest problem, right? That I would, that would upset me, you know, like most YouTube videos don't have subtitles on them, right? They have some subtitles for like the 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 big points but most of, of like on a word to word level there are no subtitles but the other thing which actually maybe even now that i think about it a bigger problem depending on your priorities is that you're missing out on a lot of the nuance because basically a lot of of spoken communication has to do with the subtle inflections that show up when you actually physically say something, right? I could take any single written sentence, right? Like let's say I take this sentence right here. Uh, I believe I'm at stage four of the refold roadmap, right? You could say this sentence in a million ways. You could say, well, I believe I'm at stage four of the refold roadmap. You could say, I believe I'm at the stage four of the refold roadmap. I mean, you could literally say this like an infinite number of ways. And each of those would have a subtly different feel, a subtly different nuance to it. And I know what, when you're watching something with subtitles, it feels like you're still picking up on that, but you're really not. I mean, first of all, if, if we're assuming that if you turn the subtitles off, you wouldn't understand it, what that means is that you don't actually have the listening ability to fully pick up on all the subtle nuance that is existing there in the sounds of the language, right? So you can almost assume that there's going to be subtle little nuances there that are expressed in the spoken language that are getting removed when you write it up. Because really, the written language is, is a is a simplification. It's a abstraction of the spoken language, where a lot of the subtle details have been removed. Right? I can say I believe I'm at stage four of the refold roadmap in a million ways. All million of those ways get abstracted down to the same text. So there's way less nuance and subtlety there. And I've actually found that one time I, I will watch a show with subtitles on. And then I'll rewatch it with subtitles off. And the jokes are way funnier when the subtitles are off because so much of comedy has to do with the subtle, super subtle, tiny inflections in your voice. And when I was reading the subtitles and only listening to the sounds in the background, I didn't pick up on that, right? I was kind of splitting my brain's attention between the, the sound and the, the text. And so I didn't pick up on all the subtlety. And the second the second piece here, in front of the, the last downside I'd say is that when, whenever you're watching something with subtitles, you, your eyes have to be at the bottom of the screen, right? Because you have to actually read the subtitles and the subtitles are at the bottom of the screen, at least for a couple seconds per subtitle line, right? Let's say you can read really fast. It only takes you three milliseconds. Well, still, 
your eyes are now bouncing up and down between you know the actual video and the subtitles and when you're when you're when it's like a sophisticated action scene and you want to be seeing every single little thing happening on the screen or exactly what the facial expressions are in like an emotional scene well you're going to be distracted from that missing out on the nuance because you you keep having to read this thing at the bottom of the screen right and then you only when you're reading the subtitles you're only seeing what's happening on the screen through your peripheral vision so i mean i don't know about you but for me it's a way more pleasant experience to watch something with the subtitles off and just take it all in, you know? Your eyes are focused where you need to be. Your ears are picking up all the subtle nuance. It's just a much more immersive and powerful experience. And so for me personally, I always turn subtitles off except when I'm eating. When I'm eating, then, you know, it's hard to hear over yourself chewing sometimes. And so then I'll turn the subtitles on. And this is for my native language and in Japanese. But when I like really want to enjoy something, then most of the time I turn the subtitles off. And it's really important to me that I'm actually able to watch without subtitles. In English, I actually, this is kind of weird, I actually turn the subtitles on more in English than in Japanese, just because I feel like the way that English movies are mixed sometimes is really weird. And, you know, the the the, te- the speech is like way quieter than the sound effects and the music. And so sometimes it's like actually hard to hear what people are saying. And so, and, and obviously I'm not trying to improve my listening ability in English. So I actually turn the subtitles on in English, but in Japanese, I try to make a point of always turning them off except when I'm eating so that I can always keep my listening ability in like tip top shape and have a more immersive experience. So that was all for this week. Thank you so much for your questions and I'll see you guys in the next one.